So glad to be with you again this morning and appreciate the privilege to speak again, to take up where we left off last night and try to finish uh, our little stuff on the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, I want to thank the church for holding this conference. It takes a lot of work and a lot of money to hold a conference and we appreciate all you've done. Uh, thanks to those of you who've come so far. I uh, just was thrilled last night to see my, my brother Lanny Phillips from Texas. Came all the way here to New York. That's, uh, that costs too. Um, and my friends from way up in Maine, about three uh, miles, I think they say, from the Canadian border. So they were almost in your country, Joe. But um, uh, Lanny, stand up. Lanny Phillips, an old friend, a good predator from Texas. And we got a real unique family here. We got three generations from Maine, and they're all lovers of the Lord, and they all understand the predator's view and stand for it. You three ladies from Maine, stand up, and let me talk about you just a minute. We've got a, a grandmother named Lila Rogan, and her daughter Deanne, and Deanne's daughter Miriam. So the three generations, and they love the Lord with all their hearts, and they work constantly for the cause of His truth. And we just have fallen in love with them. We communicated with them for two or three years, and then last year they came down on the train, and we got to meet them. And we were so thrilled. And this year they drove through the snowstorms and got here in time for the meeting. So thank all of you for coming. And, and like I say, you don't do that without making expenditures and costs. And uh, I know it costs a lot. I hope to go to the Ardmore Conference in July, but you know, I just don't know if I'll make it. I'm trying to live on Social Security and that'll cost at least $1,000 time I buy a plane and ticket and rent hotel rooms and rent a car from Dallas down to Ardmore. But, Anyway, or up to Ardmore, but anyway, um, uh, we appreciate all you've done. Again, this morning, we love you, and we appreciate you here, you blue pointers. Um, there was a recent study, discovered a lot of things. They're always doing studies. This one had to do with, with weight. And um, they made us a surprising discovery. Uh, among other things, they found that <clears throat> women who carry around a little weight live longer than the men who mention it. <laughs> <clears throat> yep. <laughs> uh, so. Um, <clears throat> I don't think sometimes we give our women enough credit. I always, if you were ever where I was when I spoke and my wife was in the audience, I praised her to the highest, tried to put her on the highest pedestal, pedestal because that's where she belonged to be. She was just, for 55 years, wonderful, and the older she got, the more angelic she was. But anyway, some had said that one reason I've had so much grief and sorrow is because I had so much, and so when you have a lot, when you lose it, you lose a lot. And that was certainly true. But God and my friends like you have brought me through till now. But anyway, <clears throat> one day the governor and his wife came out of the Capitol office and they were walking down the street of the capital city and a construction worker waved to the wife and spoke to her by her name and she stopped and they chatted for two or three minutes there on the sidewalk. And uh, then they went on down the street and the governor said, well, who was that? He said, it was a man I used to date uh, before we got married. And, and uh, the governor with a little pride in his voice says, uh, well, you see, if you'd have married him, you'd have been a construction worker's wife. He said, no, I wouldn't. He said, oh, yes, you would. You'd have been a construction worker's wife. She said, no, I would not. If I had married him, he would be governor. 
So we have to give our women lots of credit. <laughs> Behind every great man is a great woman. And uh, I believe that with all my heart. And we're continuing this morning on our subject of the new heaven and the new earth from Revelation 21. Um, this is not difficult in comparison to Revelation 20. So um, uh, last night we tried to lay a lot of groundwork. Some of you were here, some of you weren't, and some of you did, some didn't come back. But we saw in Isaiah 56 where God began to create a heaven and an earth, which was the old covenant system where Israel lived for about 1,500 years. We saw in Isaiah 65 where he decided to build a new heaven and an earth, a new Jerusalem, which we said was a new covenant system. In the New Testament, we saw Jesus pre predicting that the old heaven and earth would pass away. He preached that something better was at hand, the kingdom of heaven. And we saw that the kingdom of heaven was synonymous with the new heaven and the new earth. We saw where Paul and Peter preached the same message. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but, but a new kingdom, a new heaven and earth were on the horizon. We ended in 2 Corinthians 5 with Paul being weary of living in his old earthly house, which we says was the old covenant world of Judaism, the law of Moses and all that entailed, and he yearned for his new eternal house from heaven to come down. He wanted to live in it. This eternal house was the new heaven and earth, the kingdom. It was a new covenant, the world of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, his spiritual kingdom. And we begin this morning kind of where we left off there. We asked this question about Paul when he was talking about he knew he had a, earthly, had a heavenly house and not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And we said, how did Paul know about this house? This heaven not made with hand, in heaven not made with hands. This new place to live. Well, Paul had not had more again direct revelation than we can ever imagine. But we mentioned last night that one place he could have drawn his thoughts from was John 14, 1 through 3, where Jesus promised to build a new place for his disciples to live. In my opinion, Here's another one of the perhaps most misunderstood scriptures in the Bible. But let us look at those first three verses. Let not your heart be troubled. We're in John 14, if you want to turn. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, obviously the old King James. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. This sounds like a new heaven and earth, doesn't it? Because it's going to be a new place to live. Many people in the Christian world picture Jesus in heaven with a huge crew of builders and carpenters and masons, and he's, he's building one, mason, one mansion after another as fast as he can, to try to keep up with Christians dying and going to heaven. And he's paving streets with pure gold. And most Christians want to walk on those streets. And most Christians want one of those mansions. I hear him saying, I'm going to mansion when I get to heaven. And they're betting on getting one, as I said, when they get to heaven. Uh, there's a song in Christianity called, I've Got a Mansion. And this is not my point about it, but part of that song says, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. And part of what's wrong with Christianity today is that everything is just over the hilltop. And you never get it. You, you never get to enjoy it. Hallelujah. But I'm living in my mansion this morning. And you are too, if you know Jesus and have come to understand his truth. But I was getting to this point. Well, another verse says, I want to go one. That silver line, man, how gaudy would that be? <laughs> you live in a gold house with silver line, and then you walk out on the streets of gold, you'd get tired of that soon, wouldn't you? <laughs> but in the minds of most Christians, Jesus built, building mansions in the sky, preparing a place for them to spend eternity. Now, I don't know much about eternity. There's not a lot in the Bible about after we die. But John 14 is not about big houses. 
And you that know your Bibles know that the word mansion should be dwelling places. And Jesus was saying that in my father's house, there's plenty of places to live. Jesus was not talking about carnal, physical houses to live in, but spiritual dwelling places, a better place to live than the old covenant, a better heaven and earth. Jesus wanted everybody to live where he was living. He said that where I am, there ye may be also. Where was Jesus living? He said, where I am. That's present tense. Not where I'm going to be one day, but where I am right now. So where was Jesus? Well, he continued on and he told them in verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? That's where I am. And he repeats himself in the 11th verse saying, Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me. And Jesus promised his disciples that he was going to prepare a place for them to live where he was presently living. And then he tells them in verse 20 of John 14, at that day, that is, when I get it all prepared, when, when it's all finished, when my building project is over, when I get this new heaven and earth constructed, ye shall know that I am in the Father. And oh, here we go, saints. Here's our new place to live. And ye in me, and I in you. Hallelujah. This is the dwelling place that Jesus had come to build. Not some kind of physical house, but a spiritual dwelling place where we could enjoy God as he enjoyed God. And we could have intimate fellowship with the Father as he had with the Father. A spiritual house, a spiritual dwelling place, a spiritual new heaven and earth. And Paul was anxious to move in. You can call it a mansion if you want to. It's all with me. It's a magnificent place to live. As long as you understand it's a spiritual house. I go to prepare a place, Jesus said. Where did Jesus go? Well, right off he went to the cross to begin to prepare a place for us to live. First he had to take care of our sin, get that out of God's way so we could live where he was living. He paid the price for our sin by his sacrifice. Then in his resurrection he conquered death. He ascended. He sent his, he sent his guarantee at Pentecost. He offered his blood for our atonement in the heavenly sanctuary. Still working on the new heavens and the new earth. He returned victorious. Demolished the earth of the house where Paul had grown for so long. That is the old heaven and earth passed away. And then he established the new heaven and earth. His kingdom among men. A new superior spiritual place to live. A place where men could have intimate fellowship with God. And likewise, God with men. And after all, this is what God had always wanted. Is this not what John saw in Revelation 21 3? I heard, of great, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. This is the kind of place to live that Jesus had promised to build in John 14 and 20. And at that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. The new heaven and earth is not a physical heaven and earth like the old one, but it was a spiritual dwelling place. The old one was only a shadow of what was to come, the spiritual new heaven and new earth. I think it is reasonable to say that God was not happy and satisfied with the old heaven and earth that he created. I think it gave him a lot of heartaches and headaches and left him without the intimate fellowship he wanted with his man and his woman, and without the joy he wanted to find in his creation. In Isaiah, in Isaiah 65 and 19, that we read for you last night, when God was talking about the new heaven and the new earth and the creation of a new Jerusalem, he said, I will rejoice. And brother, brother uh, Mike read this last night after I sat down. He says, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. In the new heaven and the new earth, not only be a wonderful place to us to be, but God was going to enjoy it too. He was going to enjoy his people 
like he never had before. Not only were the people going to have a better heaven and earth, but God was going to find joy and rejoice in there too. God had been unfulfilled by Israel's old heaven and earth. He determined not to build another one like that. He decided that the new heaven and earth would be a spiritual one. And this is what he meant when he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. That's what he meant, I think. It's not, it's not something you see. It's not something that we're going to build here on 4th Street here in Jerusalem or whatever. This, and this is, why, this is why in John 6, when they wanted to make Jesus a king, he slipped away from them and went up into the mountains. He had no interest in a natural kingdom. He was not interested in another physical heaven and earth. The heaven and earth on his mind and heart that he was working on those 40 years would be a spiritual kingdom. That spiritual heaven and earth was what Paul was referring to in 2 Corinthians 4 and 18 when he said, the things which are not seen are eternal. The, the seen things, the things you could see was the old heaven and earth. The things you could not see was a new one that he was building. It wasn't a physical eyesight kind of, a, of observation. The old heaven and earth was physical, but it was a shadow of the spiritual new heaven and earth that God was working on now. And this is what John meant in John 4 when he told the Samaritan woman at the well, the time was coming when God's people would worship, not worship him, neither in, the, worship him neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You know, under the old heaven, oh no, under the old heaven and earth, had the importance of coming to Jerusalem and, and doing your worship there. Jesus said, "A time's gonna come when that don't matter." In the kingdom of God, Jesus was appearing for His people. Now, geography was no longer important. His people could worship Him anywhere. The old Jerusalem would be of no importance than any other city in the world. And I wish today that the Zionist Christians could come to understand this. Maybe we could have peace in the Middle East. Saints, geography has no role in the new heaven and the new earth. The Zionists want to build a temple today in Jerusalem. They want Jesus uh, to be installed as the king. But I tell you, if they build a temple over there, says the Beth, Jesus would have no more interest in that temple than he had in the one that was on the earth when he was here. God never was interested in living in an earthly temple anyway. In Acts 7, 48 and 49, it says, How be it the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Yet, most Christians anticipate Jesus setting up a natural kingdom in Jerusalem. And if that happened, uh, Sister Meredith, I'd want to fly to the Middle East to see him. But then you know there'd be 50 million other people that want to see him too. And my chance of an audience with Jesus would be so, so little. But glory to God this morning in the new heaven and earth, in his spiritual kingdom, you and I can see Jesus now. You can I get more audience with him this morning. Hebrews 4 and 16 says that we can come boldly to his throne of grace and find all of the mercy and the grace we need right here in Blue Point, New York. Hallelujah! That's a new kingdom, people. And that's a difference in the physical and the spiritual. In the old heaven and earth, God lived in a man-made temple located in the holy city. In the new heaven and earth, a spiritual kingdom, you and I who believe are his temples and he lives in us. We're located in that new Jerusalem. That spiritual city. But until Jesus returned, the saints were still living in that old earthly house. Those of you who weren't here last night, I apologize. But we talked a lot about that then. But they were still living in that old earthly house. That old covenant system. That old heaven and earth. Still, still without total fulfillment in the kingdom of God. Well, that's groundwork. Let's get to the completion of this building project. The construction of the new heaven and new earth. If we want to find the finished work of Jesus, perhaps we should go to the last book in the Bible. To the next to the last chapter to our text. 
Oh, folks, this is beautiful. I hope you're seeing it. I hope you're getting it. I hope you're feeling what I've been preaching last night and this morning. And I hope the joy and the gladness is welling it up in your hearts as you realize what a magnificent place God has created for people to live today. Hallelujah. Perhaps now we have enough background about heaven and earth to indeed go to our text. And so it starts off, turn, turn with me to Revelation 21 if you have your Bibles and would like to. Uh, <clears throat> starts off there, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Well, after all we said last night, and after all, a little bit we said this morning, it ought to be obvious to us what John saw in this miraculous vision of the new heaven and the new earth. It was the world of the new covenant. It was the world of the Messiah. It was the world of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was the spiritual kingdom of God that Jesus said was at hand when he preached. It was that place where salvation resided, where grace and forgiveness lived. It was a place Jesus went to prepare for his people that where he lived, you and I could live too. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. And that day had come when the millennium was over, Brother, brother Ed, and, and when the Lord had come back uh, as he had promised. And with him he brought a new place to live, a new house, a new covenant, a new kingdom, a new spiritual dwelling place. And that's what John saw when he saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down. If we believe in Jesus' day, then this new heaven and new earth is a spiritual blessing, the spiritual place where we live in intimate fellowship with God. In John 18 and 36, Jesus answered said, my kingdom is not of this world. Again, that first heaven and earth of Israel was a natural kingdom. It was of this world. But it was a shadow of the real kingdom, the spiritual kingdom that was not of this world, the kingdom not made with hands. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, he said. Isaiah promised it. We read it for you last night in the 65th chapter. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And now God had done it. Peter said they were looking for a new heaven and a new earth, as we told you last night. They said they could hardly wait. They were hastening to the day of the coming of the Lord. And now God had come and he had done it. In the Revelation, Jesus showed John his finished work. I told you last night that we get to the climax of all of this today, to the good part, to the glorious part. And in 70 AD, when the Lord destroyed in judgment the old heaven and the earth, the old earthly house, the old covenant system, the new house not made with hands was ready for occupancy. And of course, some say, no, this is yet to come. The heaven and earth is future, and I beg your pardon this morning. Brother Ed and I both have talked about how the first chapter in the Revelation and the last chapter in the Revelation are like giant bookends that can find all those prophecies to a time shortly and soon after John received them. And I don't know how some of the partial preterists can, can go along for most of the Revelation and, and say, it is, it is all has happened, and, but to take one or two chapters and say, this is it, how has it happened yet? Where do you get that license? How do you do that? God, God is, as Brother Ed said, he didn't say, they might be done. It's possible to be done, but it must be done shortly. And surely it's not 2,000 years. Hallelujah. Amen. Here's another great dilemma for Christianity. Either Jesus, his prophecies to John in the Revelation were fulfilled soon after John received them, or Jesus gave John false information, making our Savior a false prophet. And that's the dilemma for Christianity today. But I believe they indeed did come to pass shortly. I saw a new heaven and earth. And then he says, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. Well, you know what he's talking about. After last night, you know that first heaven and the first earth was an old covenant system where Israel lived for 1,500 years. And now it was gone. It was passed away. 
Again, you know what passed away. Gone was the world of the old covenant. Gone was the law of Moses. Gone was condemnation and guilt. Gone were Jerusalem, the temple, and national Judah. And this is exactly what Jesus prophesied when he said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away or fail. And his word did not pass away, but heaven and earth did. And as we've seen, Isaiah, Peter, and Paul prophesied the same thing. The heaven and earth that passed away was the old covenant system. The place that, to live that God had created for his people Israel in Isaiah 51. And this new heaven and earth that God had created for Israel some 1,500 years earlier was utterly, utterly destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. It was the first heaven and earth, and John saw as a new one came down from heaven that the old one was gone. It was that old house that Paul was living in. It was that old tab tabernacle in which he was groaning. It was that old body from which he longed to be absent so God's church and his people could fully be in the presence of the Lord. John called that old system the first heaven and the first earth. And by 70 A.D., the new spiritual house to live in had been built by the Almighty. And John called it a new heaven and a new earth. Sadly, apparently, Paul didn't live to see his new heavenly house come down from earth. He was martyred first, I think. Brother Ed could tell us for sure. And then John says, there was no more sea. Why is that thrown in here? Oh, church, this is beautiful. This is beautiful. Generally in the Revelations, the land represented Israel. The sea represented the Gentiles. And as the land and the sea were divided, so the Jews and the Gentiles were divided. And, and in the words of our topic, the Gentiles couldn't live in the whole heaven and earth. God had built that for his people, Israel. But in the new heaven and earth, that division was gone. There was no more sea. In the kingdom of heaven, everybody is equal. No longer does it matter who your earthly father is, but whosoever will can take of the water of life freely. Hallelujah. No more sea. Is that not beautiful? Oh, new heaven and earth comes on the scene, and the old one is gone, and the division is out of the way. Everybody, anybody can live in the new heaven and earth. The second verse says, And I, John, saw the holy city in New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. John saw inside the new heaven and new earth a new Jerusalem. It was the early church, I believe, ready to become the bride of Christ. And then the mother of millions of us who would come to believe in Jesus. What's a new heaven and earth without a new holy city? When Isaiah prophesied in 65, he prophesied the new heaven and earth. He also prophesied a new Jerusalem. by saying, behold, I create Jerusalem, a rejoicing and her people of joy. In the allegory of Sarah and Hagar, Paul told the Galatians that their Jerusalem was above. Where was Paul's house? It was in heaven. Where he wanted to come down from, from heaven. And now John saw it coming down. Paul further told the Galatians that this new Jerusalem, which at that time was above, he said, was the mother of us all. John said the new Jerusalem looked like a bride adorned for her husband. Paul told the early church in 2 Corinthians 11 and 2, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Paul was working tirelessly to prepare that early church for its wedding to Jesus when the bridegroom would return. And John in 21 says, she is coming down. I see her. She's prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And a couple of chapters earlier in 19 and 7, John saw another picture of the bride. He said, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come and the wife has made herself ready and his wife has made herself ready. Paul had done his work well 
Brother Ed, in preparing the church to be the bride of Christ. And here's a little something I'll just throw out for you, a little sideline. I may be wrong, like I am about a lot of things, but I think the bride of Christ was the early church or some portion of it. It is hard for me to think of the church today, you and me, as being the bride of Christ. And yet that's what we've always said. Maybe you can help me, but it doesn't seem to fit. I mean, the wedding was 2,000 years ago when the Lord returned and took his bride. And I was not even born then. How could I be his bride? To me, here's what fits better. Jesus took his bride, that early church that Paul had been struggling to make a chaste virgin for him. And from that union 2,000 years ago, children, sons and daughters, you and me, have been born into the family of God. We are his children, the result of the marital relationship that Jesus had with his virgin bride. And that bride, the New Jerusalem, Paul said, is the mother of us all, spiritually, of course. But how can you and me be the bride of Christ, the mother of his children, and be his sons and daughters too? It don't, don't fit. Something, again, just for you to think about, not the gospel, but just Glen Hill's musings. But most Christians, they're in real trouble with the things about the wedding. They never thought about it, I don't think. But most Christians today do not think Jesus has even yet taken his bride. And the bride's been waiting 2,000 years because John saw her 2,000 years coming down and she was ready. She's standing there in her, her white gown and her long veil and she's ready 2,000 years ago and he hasn't taken her yet? Oh, wow. Where are you at, Raven? He hadn't taken it yet, but they tell me November is, is the set date. We'll see. But 2,000 years, that's a long time to wait. And that's not the only complication. They're looking forward to attending the wedding in the sky and sitting down at a marriage feast. And I think about some time, Brother Steve, how long is that table going to be? And we all want to sit down at that natural table and have a natural feast because of the wedding. And with all that marriage stuff yet in their future, Christians today have the audacity to call themselves the children of God. Wow! If Jesus has not yet married his bride, then we're all illegitimate children born out of wedlock. Now that's a problem. Hallelujah. But when John saw it coming down 2,000 years ago, she was ready. And God came down, Jesus came back, and he took his bride. And sons have been daughters have been born to Jesus all through the centuries. Out of that relationship, hallelujah, between God through Jesus and his, and his church. Hallelujah. The new heaven and new earth was here. A new place for God to live. Instead of the law of Moses, we got the gospel of Jesus Christ. Instead of condemnation and guilt, we get forgiveness and righteousness. And instead of death, we get eternal life. Do you remember that Paul's house from heaven swallowed up death? Wow, what a place to live. But it's where you and I dwell this morning in the kingdom of God. And verse 3 of 21 says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with the men. He will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Oh, Christians, we get to carry our Jesus around with us. This is what God wanted all the time. The intimate, personal relationship with you and me. And hallelujah, God was finished with trying to go through kings and priests and religious rituals to get to me and you. And in the new heaven and earth, he moved out of that holy temple in Jerusalem and he moved off that mountain in Samaria and he taken up residence in his people and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Message Bible is just beautiful right here. I don't use it much. It's obviously not a, a translation. But, but the Message Bible here in verse 3 says, Look, look. God has moved into the neighborhood. Wow. Isn't that beautiful? 
And isn't that wonderful? And this is what Jesus had promised at that day. And that day arrived in 70 AD. At that day you shall know that I am in the Father and ye in me and I in you. In the new heaven and earth, God had moved into the neighborhood. And this is what he wanted all the time. What a wonderful new heaven and earth for you and for me. Now the early church had finally gotten absent from the body and present with the Lord. Do you see this? They had finally moved from their earthly house to their eternal house not made with hands. Do you see that? They were finally freed from the old covenant and entered fully into the new. Paradise had been restored. The intimate fellowship that God had once had with Adam and Eve before they sinned was now back in place and that's what God had always wanted. And he said in Isaiah 65 about this new Jerusalem, I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And this brought joy back to God himself. This intimacy with you and me. God's happy and his people are happy. Hallelujah. And God shall wipe away all tears, verse 4 says, from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. People are looking naturally for a time to come in a physical sense when there won't be any more heartaches and burdens and we won't cry anymore. There won't be any more tears and no more pain. But saints of God this morning, this is all spiritual agony. Let's look at verse 4 again in Revelation 21 and see if we can see what caused the pain and the suffering to cease. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. Why? For the former things are passed away. Praise the Lord. Something had passed away, Brother Lanny, and that passing of something away had caused untold sorrow and crying to cease. And you know what passed? It was that old covenant written and graven on stones. It was that letter that killeth. It was that ministration of death. It was that ministration of condemnation and guilt. And hallelujah, it was gone in John's vision. And gone with it were the tears and sorrows of a religious system that always left you condemned and guilty. They traded in for something better. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, that is the law, but after the spirit, that is the grace of the new covenant. They had traded law, a law they couldn't keep for a life that was going to keep them. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Isaiah 25, 8 and 9, I won't read it, but God had promised there to wipe away tears. Isaiah 25, 8 and 9. And he promised it that he would do it with his salvation. Oh, isn't that beautiful? Hallelujah. This is where Paul wanted to live. This is the house he wanted to come down from heaven. This is the house not made with hands that swallows up death. Because a new heaven and a new earth the new covenant gives us life eternal. What a place to live. They traded in law for grace, guilt for mercy, death for life, condemnation for forgiveness. They traded the old covenant for the new. They traded the law of Moses for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. And he that said in verse 5, he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Wow. Had Jesus not made all things new, completely wiped out a whole heaven and earth and made a brand new one. Hallelujah. Gone was the old physical heaven and earth and created was a new dwelling place for God's people. His building project was complete. His new heaven and earth was ready for occupancy. And you and I get to live in it this morning and live in it now, not a thousand years from now. Hallelujah. In Hebrews 12 and 22, there is a time that Paul said that the faithful had come to the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Now we can think of this as one of those already but not yet passages. But I prefer to think of it like this. In Hebrews, the church had come to the New Jerusalem. They weren't inside yet. They were standing at its gates waiting for them to open. And now those gates swung wide open. And whoever was thirsty could 
to come in and take of the water of life freely. And verse 6 says, And he said unto me, It is done. It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give unto him that is a thirst the fountain of the water of life freely. Hallelujah. It is done. Reminds me of it is finished. And I understand that that's what the priest said when he came out from that atonement. It is finished. That's what Jesus said when he gave his life for us. But hallelujah, it wasn't all finished. His work, well, he hadn't been resurrected yet. Hallelujah, he hadn't ascended yet to offer his blood. He was still working. But now we get to a point here in the next to the last chapter in the whole Bible when Jesus says, it is done. What powerful and mighty words they are. And we could say, Jesus, what is done? And he might could say to us, do you remember Zechariah's prophecy? 13 and 1, in that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and in the habits of Jerusalem for sin and uncleanness. It is done. Hallelujah. The verse we very read, verse 6 says, I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of life freely. Glory, it is done. What is done, Jesus? Do you remember he said that the old heaven and earth would pass away? It's done. Judaism was gone. The law was gone. Jerusalem was gone. The temple was gone. It's done, Jesus said. Do you remember the promise through Isaiah that I'd create a new heaven and a new earth? Do you remember Peter writing to the church and saying, look for that promise. It's done. It's here. Do you remember the promise I made you when I was with you? That there are plenty of places in my father's house to live. That I was going to prepare a place for you to live. And that I'd come again and receive you unto myself. And I told you that day that, that you would know that I'm in the father. And you and me and I and you. It is done. That day is here. John saw it accomplished. In his vision, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. Look, look, God has moved into the neighborhood, making his home with men and women. When creating the new heaven and earth, not only did God build a better place for us, but created a better place for himself to live in the hearts and the lives of his people. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. It is done. What is done, Jesus? What do you remember? That we said that the old covenant had waxed old and was ready to vanish. It's gone. Do you remember my promise? Yet in a very, very little while, I will come and won't tear anymore. It's done. I'm here. Do you remember I promised to shortly crush Satan beneath your feet? It's done. It's over. And I don't believe my my view is that it's some evil spirit that the Lord crushed but it was that Judaic religious system and its leaders that were persecuting the church that adversary was gone do you remember Jeremiah's prophecy the Lord could say that I would make a new covenant with the house of Judah and of Israel and the next time I was going to write my laws in their hearts and not on stones and I'd be their God and they'd be my people it is done glory to God Hallelujah. Do you remember that I told you when you saw the armies compass in Jerusalem to look up that your redemption was denied hand and that the kingdom of God was denied hand? It's done. Do you remember Abraham looked for a city whose foundation without, uh, whose builder and maker is God? Do you remember that in Hebrews? John saw it coming down. It's done. Abraham, it's here. It's here. The kingdom of God is now with men. The new heaven and the new earth and new Jerusalem. And church, we get to live and enjoy the righteousness and the peace and the joy in the Holy Ghost that is the kingdom of God. It's our new place to live. And we could go on and on and on. Hallelujah. Uh, there's too much here to preach. We, we, we ought to live our lives and they ought to be running over with joy and happiness. We ought to be full of victory and freedom, full of gratitude and appreciation, overflowing with His Spirit and blessing the world. I think sometimes Christians forget the fact that Jesus did not only give His life for us, but that He gave His life to us, that He might live in us, and that through us He might bless the world. We ought to be telling others and showing them every day by our lives 
that we've found a glorious place to live now. And we don't have to wait for it a thousand years. And that this fountain of water is flowing freely and anybody can move into this wonderful place, into this new Jerusalem, hallelujah, that we've been studying about. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm here to tell you this morning, as I said earlier, I'm on, I live in my mansion already in the New Jerusalem. I'm on, I'm on Hallelujah Boulevard, the fourth house from the corner. Praise the Lord. But there's some vacant lots over on Salvation Street this morning. And if you don't know this Jesus, and if you don't understand what all I'm, that crazy preacher is talking about, then you can know and you can understand. And you can build your house right there on that vacant lot on Salvation Avenue. And as the Old Testament said, build your house and plant your vineyard in the new heaven and the new earth. Hallelujah. Most of my life, I didn't know the joy of God. Most of my life, I struggled to get good enough to be saved. And I finally found His grace. Hallelujah. And I'm glad this morning, that, that, that there were, even though there were those days when I read that scripture where Jesus said, Come unto me, all you that labor, and, and, and you shall find rest for your souls. And I said, Lord, I'm laboring, I'm laboring, I'm laboring, but I'm not finding any rest. But I'm here to tell you this morning, this old preacher's found rest in the new heaven and the new earth. Hallelujah. And I'm enjoying God more than I ever did. And I'm an old man. And my prayer was just, Lord, let me live a few more years so I can spread the joy that fills my heart now. Have been found. Hallelujah. That is not all yonder, but it's here. Praise his name. Hallelujah. I'm so glad of that. Hallelujah. I have come to find the righteousness, the peace, and the joy that is the kingdom of God. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And we could go on and on and on. There's so much to be said. But hallelujah. Say some for another time. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we thank you this morning for our new place to live. Oh, we're so glad we don't have to live under that age like the adulterous woman. She was destined to be stoned. Ah, oh, but you gave her a glance into the new heaven and the new earth. You forgave her and told her to go away and sin no more. And hallelujah, Father, we get to live in that wonderful place this morning under that wonderful covenant of love and grace and forgiveness. And we live our lives in praise and honor to you. We live our lives working and laboring for you, not to try to get somewhere, but because we are somewhere. Hallelujah. Not trying to be saved, but because we are saved. Not trying to help you make you love us, but because you do love us and have provided for us the most magnificent habitation that man could ever hope for. Oh, Lord, take our feeble words and let them burn their way into the hearts and the lives of these people and let them make sense and let them fill their hearts with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.